What I do have is that it's 3.30 and I think we're going to kick this meeting off, so um, I'll get started. I uh, just wanted to thank everybody for joining us today for HMSC's research seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffat, and I am the research program manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, located in Newport, Oregon, and I will be one of your hosts today. Uh, a couple of logistics, which you might have already found out if you are not familiar with our format, is this is a Zoom meeting. However, we have your mics, cameras, and screen shares disabled. If you could help us by keeping it that way during this meeting, that helps folks that have low bandwidth um, be able to stream this and participate with us. So we'd appreciate that. Um, that does mean, though, that we would love for you to put in any of your questions in the chat box. Uh, you can find that either at the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on what kind of platform you're using. Click on the little word that says chat. You'll get a pop-up box. You can put questions in there. Um, they go to uh, everybody if you'd like them to or just to the co-hosts, um, and we'll answer those questions at the end. So please feel free to put those questions in at any time. Um, I also wanted to let folks know that we are recording this event. It will be up in a couple of days on the HMSC website under Visit Hatfield Past Seminars. So if you're curious about that or you would like to share it with somebody else, feel free to find it there. Give me a few days. It takes a little bit to get it processed, but then it'll be up and on that site. A couple of very quick announcements. I wanted to let everybody know that we are doing our monthly Science on Tap next Tuesday uh, virtually. Uh, on April 20th, we have Vera Trainer from NOAA's Northwest Fishery Science Center who will be talking to us about why are the crab and clam fishery closures happening at a greater frequency over the last few years, exploring harmful algal blooms and if they're getting worse over time. So that'll be a really interesting talk. So if you're interested in that, um, please join us next Tuesday. I also wanted to let folks know that um, same time, same place next week, believe it or not, it's already April 22nd. We have McKenna Haney from OIMB at uh, University of Oregon, who will be talking about her graduate work with Basket Stars. So if you're interested in that, um, feel free to join us next week. Um, and if you need information about um, any of those talks or any of our upcoming events, or you need any login information, you can go to HMSC on Google or whatever platform you use hit our homepage, scroll to the bottom, and our calendar of events is there, and all of the login information will be available to you. But why you're all here today is for our today's speakers, which have been invited to us by Tommy Swearinger from uh, ODFNW. So Tommy, I'm gonna hand it off to you to do introductions. Thanks, Cinnamon. Our two speakers today are Max Nielsen Pincus and Kagan Scully Inglemeyer. Uh, Max is an associate professor and currently the chair of the Department of Environmental Science and Management at Portland State. Max's research and teaching focuses on the human dimensions of natural resources and environmental management. His uh, research has applications in wildfire, forest management, watersheds, and coastal management. His research is currently supported by the U.S. Forest Service and the National Science Foundation. Max has a PhD in natural resource management from the U of Idaho in the Department of Forest Resources, a master's in environmental and community studies from Antioch on the uh, Seattle campus of Antioch, and is, uh, has a bachelor's in environmental economics from the University of Oregon. Kagan's a fifth year PhD student in the Earth Environment and Society program at Portland State. He's a member of Elise Granick's Applied Coastal Ecology Lab Group, and a lot of the audience probably knows Elise. His research focuses on land management and aquatic contaminant exposure in both freshwater and estuarine habitats in the coast range, as well as ecosystem services values in coastal and marine areas. Uh, Kagan has an undergraduate in environmental studies from the U of O and actually began his uh, graduate work at PSU at Portland State in the Master's in Environmental Management program before transferring into the doctoral program. And Kagan's father is Paul Engelmeyer, whom again, many in the audience probably know. 
So, and with that, I'll turn it over to Max and Kagan. Well, greetings, everybody, and uh, and welcome, and, and thank you for being here today, and thank you, Tommy, for that uh, that pleasant introduction. Um, I'm uh, really happy to be here before you today, and. Uh, while I wish I could see you all, I certainly guess there's a benefit to not having to leave my home office either. So, um, so let's get started. Uh, Kagan and I are going to talk today about some work that that we've uh, collaborated on around public perceptions of coastal resources and marine protected areas, uh, where we're kind of exploring the drivers of su of support for and values for Oregon's marine uh, reserves. Um, and as as Tommy mentioned a moment ago. Um, a lot of this work is also in collaboration, and I feel like she should probably be listed here as an author, but uh, with um, uh, with Elise Granick at Portland State University. So I just want to recognize her contributions as well. Oops, let me figure out where the next slide button is. There we are. So just starting with a little bit of an agenda of what we're going to cover today. Uh, I want to start, and I guess this is my department chair, uh, you know, hat coming on. I want to start with a little bit of discussion about marine reserve work uh, at PSU. Um, then I will uh, take over with, uh, well, I guess I'll continue then with the um, with a report on the, the study that um, that I've been involved with on influences uh, of support for marine re reserve system growth. Um, and so that'll be one piece. And then after I'm done with that piece, I'm going to hand it over to Kagan to talk about a separate study on coastal values in Oregon. And then we'll end, uh, I guess we'll end each, each kind of section with some discussion and takeaways. And we'll end the, the talk with some Q&A and discussion. Okay, so moving ahead here. Um, so first, just a little bit about uh, work uh, on marine reserves uh, and PSU. Um, so I just want to acknowledge uh, the fact that a lot of this work uh, is owed to uh, many other people, including myself and Kagan, um, as well as support from Oregon Sea Grant, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Oregon Mar Marine Reserve Program. Um, Saber Comb, I, I, and I wanted to just hit on a, a couple of past uh, pieces of work that have kind of led into uh, the body of work that we're uh, talking about today. So first is Sabra Comet's uh, Masters of Environmental Management uh, project at, at Portland State. Um, Sabra's now with the South Slough uh, National Estuary and Research Reserve. Um, and, and her Masters of Environmental Management project focused on uh, marine protected areas and tribal uses uh, over time as sort of a contribution to the baseline understanding of, of the marine reserve areas. Also Bryn Hudson's work, Bryn's now a policy analyst at the Oregon Water Resource Department, assessing effort shifts and familial succession in Oregon's nearshore fisheries. And then today I'll be talking mostly uh, about a piece Paul Manson and I and Elise worked on. Paul's now at Reed College. Uh, Paul was a PhD student at, at Portland State. Um, on focused on the public perceptions of ocean health and marine protection. Um, we're looking at drivers of support for Oregon's marine reserves. And then Kagan's going to finish us off today. Kagan, as Tommy said, is a uh, PhD student in our Earth Environment and Society program, uh, looking at participatory GIS mapping and how it highlights indirect use and existence values of coastal resources and marine conservation areas. And I'm happy to say that actually, I believe just yesterday, this paper was uh, accepted for publication in ecosystem services. So moving ahead. So let's start with uh, the first study that we're going to talk about today, public perceptions of ocean health and marine protection, drivers of support for Oregon marine reserves. So the, the main question in the study that I'm going to talk about today is are, are marine reserves maintaining Oregon's public trust obligation? Um, in, through this study, we're going to look at uh, some data that we collected and then built a, a statistical model on to explore attitudes and beliefs uh, that foster public support or, or opposition uh, to marine protection and particularly to the expansion of Oregon's uh, marine reserve system. And we'll reflect a little bit on telephone survey data that we used uh, for the study. So let's be, dive right in. Uh, so what is the public trust in coastal management? Um, well, if we look through the literature, the public trust generally identifies, or the public trust doctrine identifies that the public trust is based on having generalized benefits. Um, public resources must be man under the public trust doctrine must be managed for the benefit of the general public, while also balancing the need, uh, the needs of across many specific users. 
Um, and historically, you know, those needs and the public trust resources were really focused on traditional marine uses, at least in the marine context. So things like navigation, commerce, uh, fisheries, uh, et cetera. Um, and, but that's in recent decades has also been expanded to include recreation, aesthetics, ecology. Um, but as, as Sachs writes about um, as early as the 1970s, that these uh, sort of expanded public trust resources um, often come with a some, somewhat disorganized or uh, and potentially diffuse majority. And a, a great example of that expansion of the public trust resources um, in Oregon is Oregon's 1967 Beach Bill, uh, which created public access and, and use for all of Oregon's beaches. Okay, so let's look at Oregon's marine reserves. I probably don't need this slide in here with, uh, with this audience, uh, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, or Oregon's marine reserves, ex um, Oregon extends the public trust doctrine to, to marine conservation through its state responsibility for conservation, maintenance, and enhancement of aquatic life, fish, and wildlife for present and future generations. And to do so, Oregon created uh, five marine reserves uh, and nine associated pro marine protected areas. Each reserve has its own management plan and as I'm sure you all know, has a scientific monitoring component to it. And in some ways, this project is, is part of that monitoring component. ODFW is, is the lead agency for managing the marine reserves, but it does so in partnerships with other state agencies as well as uh, um, university partners and others. Uh, in total, uh, Oregon's marine reserve system covers about 9% of, of Oregon's territorial sea or, or that part of, of Oregon that, um, uh, or that part of the, the ocean that extends three miles out from the coastline. And you can see it arrayed in the, in the map on the right. A little bit of background on support for marine reserves. Um, what do we already know about the general public support and balancing specific uses of so those public trust ideas? Uh, some research by Mark Needham and colleagues and uh, reports and publications in 2013 and 2016 identified that 69% of coastal residents, as well as 90% of I-5 corridor residents, would vote to establish marine reserves in, in Oregon. Um, so high majorities there. Urban residents, uh, at least in Johnson's 2020 publication, uh, thought of marine reserves as really akin to terrestrial wilderness areas. And I think there's some opportunity for discussion about what marine reserves are there. Um, at the same time, and, and so we see some of that general public support, but at the same time we see uh, on the balancing of specific uses, we see some negative attitudes about marine reserves uh, and as well as individual impacts in, in the commercial fishing, fishing sector. Um, and there's some, been some reports and publications uh, on that um, particular issue. Yet nonetheless, at least according to Marino in 2015 and then Bryn Hudson in 2018, um, that we haven't seen documented evidence of a broad effort shift in uh, the fishing sector uh, as a result of the marine reserves. And then finally, I noted uh, Craig Lindbergh's uh, recent study and, and colleagues, his recent study that looked at coastal residents uh, and found that in a choice experiment, they, they had less than 50% uh, probability or likelihood that coastal residents would choose expansion of marine reserves. But that that, that, that likelihood of, of choosing expansion was really influenced by the costs and perceived impacts to fishing sector jobs that were um, available in the, in the scenarios that, that uh, Lindbergh and his colleagues presented to their respondents. So we see some, some support, we see it in different sectors here, different geographies. We also see some, uh, you, know, incre you know, some need for that balancing uh, across different uses and different communities as well, uh, continuing here. So what did we wanna do? Well, we wanted to look across Oregon in general uh, and understand how Oregon gener Oregon's general public support varies by things like their awareness of marine reserves, their residency, so what part of the state they lived in, uh, by the perceived threats they see to the ocean uh, or coastal areas, as well as the accepted uses that, that people um, uh, assign to the ocean. So that's what we're gonna dive into next here. Um, I'll start with a little bit on methods. We did a telephone survey. These are not us, but I thought it was a funny picture. Uh, we weren't doing this over Zoom. We were actually doing this in March, uh, mostly March through June of 2016 uh, with a little bit of follow-up uh, in, in the following 2017. Um, so before we were all in Zoom land, uh, we had a random sample of uh, 3,365 landline and cell phone numbers. Uh, and we called all of those numbers. Um, There's a lot of phone calling. 
uh, and screen people uh, for those who could speak English uh, and those who have resided or at least reported that they resided in Oregon for at least 12 months. Um, we developed a, a questionnaire um, and we also did some, some testing of different modes and I won't talk about that, but we, we came to this, our, our final mode of the, the telephone, random digit dial telephone survey after some pre-testing uh, and, and cognitive debrief on, on the questionnaire as well. The questionnaire itself asked questions around marine, uh, uh, ocean and coastal uh, issue awareness, as well as um, Oregon Marine Reserve awareness, perceptions uh, of respondents uh, about or ocean health, as well as what acceptable uses uh, were of the ocean and threats uh, to the ocean, to ocean health. Um, we asked about things like coastal visitation, residency, income, political party, and a, a number of other demographic issues. And then finally, we asked a, a sort of vote question. Um, essentially, if there was a, a measure on the ballot to increase the number and size of reserves in Oregon, given what our respondents knew about the Marine Reserve uh, program and, and the system of Marine Reserves, would they be willing to vote for uh, a Marine Reserve, an expansion of the Marine Reserve system in the future? So who responded? Well, we were able to reach out to 2,272 phone contacts. Um, those were positive uh, contacts that we made and we had 459 final participants, about a 20% response rate. Not, I'm not thrilled with the response rate, uh, but it's also uh, fully in line with response rates of, of other similar studies. We found uh, that the, the respondents we got roughly matched the state population distribution. And you can see that in the table here. Um, about 70% of our respondents came from the Willamette Valley and 72% of Oregon's population lives in the Willamette Valley. We had some over-representation from coastal areas, um, probably representing the salience of the issue to coastal communities. Uh, and, you know, pretty similar, uh, pretty um, matched representation from Eastern and Southern Oregon. We did see some biases in the data uh, as far as older, more educated and fewer Hispanic um, uh, respondents than in the state population. Uh, these are similar to, I think, uh, a lot of survey biases that we see in, in other places as well. And of course, our speaking English uh, requirement may have played a role in, in uh, the um, lesser uh, participation from Hispanic residents. Um, a little bit on our a summary of our responses. 89% um, of our respondents had visited the coast uh, within the last year. 13% were coastal residents. Um, on oastal, ocean and coastal resource issues, 18% uh, of our non-coastal residents and a majority of our coastal residents described themselves as well or very well informed. You see that same kind of disparity when it comes to Oregon marine reserves, but overall people are less informed about uh, marine reserves. Uh, and then finally, um, we saw that we, we found that 59% of our respondents uh, would vote yes to expand Oregon Marine Reserves. But there was a difference between what non-coastal residents and coastal residents found. So 61% of non-coastal residents uh, suggesting that they, they would vote to expand, whereas um, not a majority or 44% voted, su suggested they uh, would vote to, of coastal residents said they would vote to uh, expand the Marine Reserve system. Um, we also found about a quarter of non-coastal residents and 17% said they did not know. And that 44% of coastal residents uh, who said they would vote to expand represented a plurality of coastal residents. Um, we also talked about environmental threats. We had seven items that look at threats to coastal and ocean health uh, on a strongly agree to strongly disagree scale. We found that 48 to 76 percent uh, of our respondents uh, agreed or strongly agreed uh, that all of the seven items were uh, were coastal threats uh, or ocean threats, um, and with only 48 percent agreeing that overfishing was a problem, uh, whereas 76 percent found that uh, uh, marine debris was a problem. Um, we used an exploratory factor analysis approach to, to group these threats into different groups. And we see two major groupings, one around ecological integrity. So things like species loss, habitat loss, climate change and overfishing, and another around environmental quality. So things like pollution, marine debris, uh, and introduced or non-native species. Um, we also asked about acceptable coastal use and ocean uses. Uh, and we found that an, um, among a number of items, uh, we had uh, a majority of support, both within our whole sample, but also among coastal respondents as well. 
So interestingly enough, we found that um, the, the, an item that was labeled or described as creation of areas that prohibit fishing, harvesting, and other human development uh, was supported as an acceptable use by 67% of all respondents and 50% of coastal uh, uh, respondents as well. And you can see the, the numbers for the rest of them. So wind turbines, wave energy buoys, uh, ocean agriculture like seaweed farming and desal um, were all majority supported among all of our respondents as well as coastal respondents. And then we saw mixed support and some, op and some more opposition among some of the other um, items. So things like commercial fisheries, 44% uh, of, of all respondents supported uh, the idea of commercial fisheries in Oregon's ocean, 41% um, for shellfish farming, 37 for fish farming, but coastal residents generally were more supportive of these, these types of uh, uses as well. Um, and so what we did was we took all the data that we've been uh, describing here and we put it into a, a logistic regression model to see if we could predict uh, what, um, what would uh, influence uh, somebody's willingness to vote to expand uh, Oregon's uh, marine reserve system. Uh, and what we found was a, a, a pretty strong model uh, with a, a, a R squared or a pseudo R squared of uh, 0.44, so about half the variance being explained in it. And things like those perceived threats to ecological integrity uh, would increase the likelihood uh, that people would vote. So the more somebody thought there was a threat um, to the integrity of uh, ocean habitats uh, or species um, or the ocean ecology, uh, the more likely they would be to support um, uh, marine, the expansion of the marine reserve system. Similar with supporting for support for limiting human uses, no surprise there. Um, also, the more informed somebody was, uh, the more about Oregon's marine reserves, the more likely they were to support it. Although you can see from the line here, and I think you can see my cursor here uh, on the line, it's a little bit flatter than some of the others, so not quite as uh, a powerful of a of a determinant. On the flip side, um, we had three variables that came out as being uh, negative or, or things that would, um, that would reduce one's likelihood uh, to vote for expansion. Um, so those were support for commercial fishing, uh, Republican Party affiliation, as well as coastal residency. And so you can see how those uh, influence on the bottom row here, the likelihood that somebody would vote for uh, expanding Oregon's marine reserve system. Um, finally, I just wanted to point out the little stars that are on some of the variables here. Those stars, I just wanted to note the variability, particularly at the high end here. So for instance, being informed, while it did increase your likelihood of being willing to vote, there was a lot more variability uh, around people who were really informed. So some people were really informed uh, about Oregon's marine reserve system and less likely to, to vote for it, uh, whereas other people were more likely. Um, similar with the Republican Party affiliation, and, and here you see uh, at the high end and that a two was our code for a strong Republican uh, ideology, um, was that there were some that there was more variability around that. And also with coastal residents, you see an increased vulnerability, or not very vulnerability, but variability around uh, coastal residents as well. Um, so key takeaways. So remember first, the public trust has two obligations, general public support, and then the balancing of specific needs of users. Um, Oregon's marine reserve system, I think uh, at least from our findings, suggest uh, that they have that broad public support. Um, it's driven by uh, concerns for threats to ecological integrity, as well as support for limiting human impacts to the ocean. But we also see some room for improvement on addressing the concerns of coastal communities and the fishing industry as well. Uh, and I think the marine reserve system uh, evaluation that's coming up really offers room for that engagement. Uh, and then finally, I just note that um, while the studies vary, if we look back at, at many of the studies that have occurred in the past, as well as comparing to our study as well, um, the studies vary, but ultimately I think they tell similar so stories. And those similar stories are essentially that the program I think has generalized public support but there's still some coastal concern around it. And so I, again, I'll just go back to uh, the marine reserve system evaluation um, as, as an, a really important factor in, in uh, um, uh, the future of uh, Oregon's marine reserve system as a public trust resource. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kagan to talk about uh, the, the, the um, uh, spatial value study that we did.
Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a participatory mapping uh, survey that took place um, a couple of years back. And um, the goals of this project uh, were to explore the values held more generally by um, Oregonians, but explore them uh, spatially in a ex spatially explicit way and uh, targeting marine and coastal areas. And so to approach this project, we asked um, whether values and locations of importance placed on these in the mapping exercise would vary based on where the uh, respondent, uh, the home region of the respondent. We also were interested in understanding how the awareness and opinion of the marine reserve program and marine conservation areas, um, if that had any impact on the types of values uh, that were placed during the survey. And then finally, we wanted to understand whether the marine values placed within the marine protected or the marine uh, reserve network if they differed from coastwide averages in that um, there were larger amounts of certain types of values placed. And um, so just to get do a little background to conduct this survey, go to the next slide. Um, we used a, uh, an opt-in convenience survey format. And so basically we solicited um, participants via listservs, um, email blasts, website postings, I believe it was probably posted on the ODFNW website, uh, or the, at least the um, Marine Reserves website. And so uh, folks were prompted to use uh, a Google Map format to place value pins in locations that they um, valued for um, a variety of different reasons. And we had 15 different value categories that I'll get into in a second. Um, and so the mapping format had uh, included place names such as rivers and cities, but it did not include the uh, boundaries of the marine reserve or marine protected area network. And this was done to sort of unbias folks' um, opinions around those types of um, designations and also gain information about those resources without those designations presence. <clears throat> and so beyond the mapping um, of values themselves, participants also entered demographic information and then they also answered a series of questions about their awareness and support for uh, the Marine Reserve Program. Go next. So the values themselves, we broke out into three main categories or two main categories, three subcategories. And so the first category um, is use values. So you can go to the next slide. Um, and so these are, um, generally broken down into indirect use and direct use values. So indirect use, the biggest example of these are scenic or aesthetic uh, values or additionally recreation, like beach recreation, um, surfing, uh, you know, the, those types of recreation values would be considered indirect use. And then direct use values are more um, tangible uh, relationship values such as food, you know, timber, fishing, um, as well as uh, some other that are a little bit less tangible, like learning or tourism, that are uh, that are a little more um, that rely directly on the on the service on the ecosystems themselves or the values themselves. And so that was those were two groups. And then the other group that we um, grouped our values into, if you go next, was the non-use values, which are um, in this case we just used existence. Oh wait, back yeah, thanks. And these were uh, existence values. And so these would be more considered um, with less tangible uh, values to the user. So they are biodiversity, wildlife, intrinsic value, uh, wilderness, those would be all considered existence values. And so we grouped the values into these categories so that we could do a little bit more um, categorical analysis of, the, of what the values people placed. So next slide. So the next thing that we did, so we gathered information from um, folks prompted on coastal and marine resources. We excluded pins that were outside of the, marine pins that were outside of the contiguous zone, which is um, 24 nautical miles offshore. And then we excluded land-based pins that were um, inland of the Oregon's coastal zone, which is highlighted in blue and generally follows the Coast Range Mountain except for, I guess, in the Southern coast. But um, so we excluded those pins, but I just like to say there was a very minor amount of pins that actually got excluded in this way. So next. 
So next we, um, we grouped the respondents based on those that opted to include their zip code in the survey response. So we based them on the regions of Oregon so that we could compare how different regions um, responded to or interacted with the coastal resources. And you can see it's broken up sort of generally by county, except for Lane County and Douglas County, which are sort of cut off to um, keep the mid coast from the Willamette and Southern coast um, regions. So we grouped people like that. And next. And so in terms of response, we got, um, we had a total of 244 respondents and respondents placed on average 33 pins per person. There was a range, but that was the average. And um, as you can kind of see from, or as you can see from this table, the coastal residents were uh, overrepresented in the survey and that um, compared to the Oregon population distribution, they were um, much more uh, represented compared to the population. And in total, I think the coastal respondents had about 50%, a little bit less than 50% of the total um, response pins, which, you know, I guess it sort of speaks to, again, the salience of, the, of these issues to coastal residents compared to inland residents, perhaps. Um, so next slide. So in terms of value responses, we found that indirect use was the most commonly, or was the highest pinned value category. So like I said, this includes scenic aesthetic, recreation, and those types of values. Uh, this was followed by non-use existence values, which would be biodiversity, wildlife, wilderness, historic, these types of values were um, most commonly pinned. And this was followed by direct use, which is more, and you can see the tourism, learning and education were the highest within that category. So next. So in order to understand, um, we wanted to understand some of the regional differences in how people placed values. We um, compared the regional responses with the value types using a correspondence analysis and looked at uh, that sort of, that normalized for the response weight rate. And here what you're looking at is essentially the colored circles indicate groupings of correlated uh, regions with um, value responses that were uh, more closely associated. And so what we can really see here, for example, um, the Southern and South Coast on the left there are more, more associated with economic sport fish, motor vehicle recreation, those types of value pins were more associated with them, with those respondents. Uh, we see that the North Coast, for example, down um, in the yellow down below, those are more mostly associated with, or cl more closely associated with heritage, wilderness, and cultural services. So respondents there chose those more frequently than, than compared to other regions. And, and then also just one more example, I guess the, uh, in Eastern Oregon, you see, special place and scenic response pins are more um, associated with those folks in that region. And so this sort of just gives a little bit of insight into some of the regional specific value orientations that, um, that Oregonians might hold. And uh, again, you know, this is one survey, but it's um, interesting. It sort of confirms um, some of the, um, our ideas about, about certain areas and, and uh, uses, uses there. So you go next slide. So um, beyond the specific values themselves, we also were interested in understanding where along the coast um, people placed value pins. And so to do this, we made a series of density plots looking at the different latitudes of where people responded and where they're from. And so you can see here that the um, that people tended to place pins proximate to their home latitude. So the coastal regions played the majority of their pins within um, their region of the coast. And similarly, inland residents placed pins in more similar latitudes, indicating that there's either a travel opportunity cost component to, the, to people's values of coastal resources, and also just um, people's familiarity and usage of 
coastal and marine, re marine resources is uh, closely associated with their homes. So, um, yeah, so I, I guess you can go to the next slide there. So next we wanted to ask, how did um, the value pins placed here in this survey uh, relate to awareness and support of the marine protected areas? And so we found um, that A and B is looking at awareness and how informed people feel about marine reserve program. And we noticed that there actually was not a lot of influence in people's awareness with how they, um, the types of pins that they placed. You can see everything's broken out into those categories of direct use, existence, indirect and special place. But we did find that um, when looking at support and opposition, we found that, and you can really see this in uh, the third, the C, plot C, is that those that were strongly opposed to the Marine Reserve Program placed uh, the majority of their pins in, direct, in the direct use categories, such as tourism, things of that nature. The support, and as support increases, you notice there's a trend um, where existence values sort of replace those, uh, those direct use values. And another notable thing is that those that were unsure about how they felt, um, those users were primarily um, placing indirect use pins. So beach recreation, scenic aesthetic. So that sort of gives us a little bit of insight into people's uh, feelings about the program and their types of values that they associate with the coast. Um, and go next slide. So that was that gave us some insight into um, how individuals interacted and felt about the the coast. And so then beyond that, we wanted to under, we wanted to look at um, within the marine reserves themselves, which were not um, shown in the mapping exercise. How did um, what values were placed inside, and whether they were different than uh, the coastwide averages? And so we used the territorial sea, which is um, three geographic miles off of the coast as our um, population or as our population and looked at the marine reserves in compared with that um, coastwide average. And so in this analysis, we just see that, or in this table here, we just see that um, existence pins overall in the marine reserves were elevated compared to the coastwide averages. And um, just another note here is that you know, you can really see with the clustering here that there are specific features within each area that tend to draw the most pins and the specific types of pins also clearly, um, but that that really drives the values, um, the value placements within these areas. And so that was really interesting to kind of see. So I think, I guess just to do a little summary and go next slide here, we saw that, um, that there, we did notice that there were connections between the types of values that people held for coastal and marine resources and where they resided in Oregon. We found that closer areas um, tended up with more similar latitudes tended to receive more pins, which makes sense. Um, but really what this highlights is that people interact with the coast differently. And there are many opportunities to engage both different user groups, but also geographies within um, Oregon on coastal issues and also gives a little bit of insight into which values they associate with with the coast. And um, in terms of the marine reserves, we found that support and opposition for the marine reserve program translated to value types in that those opposed were more um, likely to be direct in, to place more direct use uh, values on coastal areas versus those um, in support. And that overall existence values, so biodiversity, wildlife, wilderness, those types were elevated from coastwide averages. So um, like uh, was just mentioned, this paper should be out before too awfully long, hopefully. So if you want more detail on any of those specifics, um, that will be available soon. But I would also just like to say that uh, this type of survey is PPGIS, is the public participatory GIS is what um, it's commonly referred to as a very useful and generally underutilized tool. And uh, it has a lot of applications. So in this case, you know, we were looking at a large group of people, um, but also 
It can be used to generate really interesting spatial data um, from specific user groups and or um, specific areas that um, are right for study. So um, with that, I think that's all I really have and we can open it up or Max, was there anything else you wanted to say other than thank you? No, that's great. Thank you uh, <laughs> all for, for uh, sitting through that with us. And I think we've got about 20 minutes or so uh, for Q and A or for discussion or what have you. So um, I was gonna say, Cinnamon, I don't see anything in my chat, so you must have the controls on those. But um, if you've got questions, I'd say, you know, or, or discussion points or thoughts that you want to bring up uh, and have a conversation with us, um, put them in the chat. Or I think you can also maybe, I don't know, Cinnamon, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but you might be able to unmute yourself uh, and just directly ask and we can have that conversation. So thank you guys. Yeah, I really encourage you at this point, I don't have any questions in my chat either. Um, so I encourage folks that have questions to put them in. I had a quick question that was just more of a detailed question. And I can read the paper if, if uh, we want to wait, but I was just going to ask if since we had time, when you're talking about um, your PPGIS research, uh, Kagan, um, how do you deal with the non randomness of those that respond? You know, because you talked about it being kind of a snowball response through certain listservs and those kind of things. And so you're not getting a, a, a randomized population to answer those questions. I was just curious about how you address that. No, absolutely. I mean, that is a barrier with that type of really engaged. Um, you really have uh, there is an effort that needs to be put to really to engage with that type of survey. And so that's something that has been um, talked about in the literature a fair amount. We didn't normalize our data for that. We, you know, I think sometimes you can choose a you can choose specific factors and normalize your your responses and give different weights to responses based on that to to distribute your survey. But um, we just took this as an opt in convenience survey and left it at that. But I I do think um, it's very difficult to get a, a fully randomized. Um, survey in this of, of this type of um, data collection because of its um, sort of involvement yeah so yeah i, I could just jump in there has a little more too well I, I could just jump in there and say you know um i think it's a really interesting and, and powerful tool it's also a really challenging one to use because the mechanism you have you, the the mech the primary mechanism of doing it or at least what what the way it's done um, you know, over the last couple of well, the last decade or so has been via web mapping applications. So you have to have a web interface for it. Uh, and in order to get a web interface, you either need somebody's email address to invite them, or you have to send them, a, you know, a link to that web interface. Uh, um, and you can do that in a number of ways. So um, you could, you know, we don't have a sort of um, general public list serve of email address, right? So typically, or one of the more common ways that uh, PPGIS studies have been used is, is with specific user groups. Uh, and, I, you know, Kagan didn't really talk about the, the list serves or, or organizations that we uh, ended up posting this through, but there's definitely a specific user group that's, um, that's represented here. Uh, and um, you know, so then you have to sort of uh, go, okay, well, what does this information, you know, who does this information represent? Um, I do think there are some things about relationships, though. Uh, for example, the relationships between, um, for example, as, as Kagan suggested, the, the support for the marine reserve system, uh, and then the types of pins, those relationships may hold, even if the balance of the, the sort of the average respondent is, is different from um, the uh, different from you know the general population average. Yeah, thank you for addressing that. Just curious. Um, we are getting a couple questions. So um, one of the ones I see is, is a lot of these results seem to fall within what would be expected from anecdotal evidence. Were there any results that were a surprise to either of you? Good question. I should have probably thought about an answer to that before we got on here, right? Uh, let's see, results that, um, well, you know, no, I think a, a lot of, you know, there there is a lot of uh, like, oh, of course, right? Um, 
to, to the results that we saw, particularly I, I think in the, the survey that I presented, those results, um, they, they fall along the lines of what I think our conventional wisdom uh, might be about who would support marine reserves and, and who doesn't. Uh, that said, I do think having the data pr presents an opportunity uh, you know, to, to really focus in and, and target where the discussion happens around uh, and so that we can, so that it, we're not just basing our discussion and our, our conversations on anecdotal evidence, but that we can target in on specific uh, areas. So for example, um, you know, one of the things, you know, I think in the conventional wisdom, uh, at least I feel like I've heard or seen in places that, you know, the, the fishing community or coastal communities really, um, you know, are more challenged by the notion of marine reserves. And what we see in our data is that there's actually a plurality of support. Uh, and so I think there is a, a segment of the population and the data would support that, that, that does have um, issues and, and some that, that may really need to be addressed. Um, but it's also not the dominant uh, kind of paradigm within those communities either. So that's, I don't know, my two cents. Good. Tommy, I, I know that you aren't necessarily one of the speakers, but I think this next question is actually um, potentially for you. Uh, how do you see this information from these types of studies being used as you all move forward? Well, I would uh, uh, mention that Max's comment that going from conventional wisdom and suppositions about support and knowledge are important. This is the empirical evidence. And uh, I think it's worthwhile to see that even within subpopulations that might support or not support, there are, there's heterogeneity. There are differences within those subsamples. Sub uh, but beyond that, um, Max uh, discussed the fact that we as an agency have uh, an, an obligation to support uh, the public trust doctrine, and uh, we as an agency have to understand what the public expectations are. Uh, it's not our role as an agency to say uh, we should expand or we should not expand. We may have empirical evidence one way or the other, but it's up to the public and it's up to the uh, politicians re representing the public to make those choices. You cannot make those choices in a vacuum. So we have to appreciate who and why, and those dialogues have to be part of the conversation. And that's our role with this uh, social science effort in general. It's to inform the discussion. Thank you, Tommy. There's a specific question, um, I think probably from Max about disaggregating who depended on the fisheries directly or indirectly. Did you see that on whether yeah. you collected livelihood? That's a, that's a great question, Kelly, thanks. Um, so we didn't uh, collect livelihood data for the, the um, you know, random uh, phone survey. Uh, and the rationale was it was a random phone survey, you know, statewide and the likelihood that we would uh, capture fishers uh, or Fisher's families in that um, was pretty low. Uh, so we didn't, and instead we captured, you know, their attitudes about support for fishing. Uh, and so that was our approach. I will say though, however, Bryn Hudson's work, uh, which we didn't present on today, that's looking at effort shifts within the fish fishing industry um, is trying to tease out some of that by looking specifically at Fisher's uh, and the changes or lack of changes or variability uh, in their effort and their catch, uh, you know, before, during, and after the um, establishment of the marine reserves on the coast. Great, um, thank you for that. And then um, Max, for your team, what is like the next project, the next thing that you're hoping to tackle and look at um, along these lines? Yeah, good question. I, I mean, I think right now is, is wrapping up this effort shift uh, um, project, which, um, you know, Bryn put a, a lot of work into it, but there's a, there's just a, a little bit more effort to get it over the line. Um, and so that's sort of the big one that I've been working on and actually been diving into the data somewhat recently. And if I could just make a quick observation on it, um, 
and, and Tommy, I look forward to having more discussion with you about this. But one of the things that, that I've seen in the data is that we, you know, there are essentially two types of fishers that we captured in uh, the effort to shift survey. And those are those fishers who don't have a lot of variability in their effort over time and those that do. And so when you look at the individuals uh, and their, you know, individual fishers and the amount of effort they're putting into getting their catch, you know, there's some that are just really narrow, you know, they put in the same effort every year uh, and have the same catch as a result for it. And there are some that are just incredibly wide distributions. And so, so really understanding that and how that plays uh, into the establishment of the marine reserves and whether there's an effect there, I think is, is kind of the next step to really understand what's going on in that sector of the, of, uh, of the issue. And just for folks, um, if you're not checking the chat, uh, Kristen just put in the link to um, Bryn's report in there. So if you want to get more information, you can uh, click in the chat and get that information. Tommy, did you want to follow up? Yeah, I was going to make one comment about Kelly's question about direct measurement of uh, fisheries involvement. Uh, Max did point out we have a separate complete study about uh, effort shift and the impact of the marine reserves and a few other fisheries management issues were part of that study as well. But in addition, we do have direct measures in uh, some of Mark Needham's work mm -hmm. and in Craig Lindbergh's study. And uh, we're also trying to look at uh, recreational fishers in uh, some of those data and the other studies as well. Uh, and specifically marine recreational fishers. So so there are, those data are there, Kelly, and audience in general, but um, part of that's a work in process. So we'll have additional data this fall related to uh, those um, stakeholder groups and their interests. And uh, I'm sorry, I kind of lost track making that point. What was your question? Well, I was just going to ask if you had any follow up to um, kind of next steps and what's happening uh, as we, we're moving closer to the report and analysis that you're working on. Well, uh, I've already mentioned uh, some replications occurring Mark Needham's surveys of which are weighted stratified samples. So we'll get representative coastal uh, respondents as well as uh, the now five corridor. Uh, we will be replicating that, and we're talking uh, right now about looking at uh, spatial knowledge to look at how these values that were teased out in this report might uh, work uh, broadly across the coast and see how people, how much people really know about where the reserves are. We know there's that level of support. Uh, have they ever been there? Do they actually know where the reserves are? Or is this just generalized support? And uh, I really want to look at the land sea connections that uh, relate to the participatory GIS exercise mm -hmm. because quite often the reserves are at uh, significant uh, areas of conservation on the terrestrial side. And do people perceive that we have uh, uh, terrestrial land sea linkages here? And how important is that? for the public. I'm very curious about that point. Nice. Um, so uh, go ahead, Max. Uh, I was just gonna follow up Tommy and, and, and say, um, you know, uh, as far as the spatial awareness issue, I, I think, you know, looking at the data that we collected in the random digit dial survey, um, there, you know, we, I think it was 5% of, of uh, non-coastal Oregonians reported being, you know, well or very well informed about the marine reserve system, and only a fifth, 20% of coastal residents. So my, my guess there is that they're not going to see a lot of spatial knowledge unless, you know, the, some sort of outreach and connection has occurred in the last, you know, four years or so since, um, and maybe it has. We, we do know there has been increased awareness. Uh, we find that in some of the visitor intercepts. Uh, but whether that translates from awareness to spatial knowledge is an uh, entirely different question. <laughs> we shall see at some point. All right. Um, I'm not seeing any other new questions. So uh, Kagan, any final thoughts for the group before we close the meeting? 
Um, I did think, yeah, on to Tommy's point about uh, the land sea connection in terms of uh, the, the spatial component of these values documented that we um, incorporated there. I think that is really interesting, especially in terms of visitation and value. So I think we didn't really get into this in this in the report or in this in this pro in my aspect of the project, but in terms of where people visit and the pins within the marine protected areas, you know, I, I don't not not as many people are out in a boat out in in, in the marine reserves, but are so in these uh, associated land areas and the adjacent um, values associated there that we didn't really capture in that um, that final piece that I was talking about. So anyway, I think it would be interesting to look into a little more. Nice. Um, if anybody has follow-up questions for our two presenters today, they have kindly shared their uh, contact information on this slide that's up. So feel free to reach out to them directly. Uh, thank you all for being here with us and hopefully we'll see you next week um, or at the Science on Tap on Tuesday night. And for our speakers, both Kagan and Max and Tommy, who I put on the spot a couple times today, um, thank you both uh, for being here, all three of you for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your work with us. Um, and we'll be interested to see what's next, Tommy, as we continue down this journey of gathering information about the marine reserves. So um, thank you all for being here. And for those online, thanks you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. In the chat, you're getting the virtual claps, and thank you very much, <laughs> just so you know that that's happening as well. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm going to end the meeting now. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye, y'all.